you're a reenactor or what would it be called in Sweden? By the way, you're from Sweden, correct? Yes, exactly. We use the term historiskt återskapande, which means like historic uh, recreation. We can get into Rome after that, but you are a, a politician on the side of this, right? Yes, I am elected to the municipal uh, council in my in my city. What got you into that? I don't have too many friends here that are in politics. Have you ever performed Testudo? Yes. What does that feel like? Favorite Roman movie? I love Life of Brian, but in terms of like an actual serious movie, I would say... Uh... Okay, if you were enslaved and put in a gladiator ring... Oh dear. What's your weapon? Well, that's not really up to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what happened to the Legion of the Ninth? They kind of disappeared. <laughs> a favorite Roman emperor? The problem is you can appreciate emperors for all the good things they did, but all of these were also like yeah, <laughs> warring, warring dictators. Favorite battle, if you have one? I don't like battle. I like when people are, are friends. <laughs> no, but there are so many. I think uh, a lot of the more interesting battles are the Roman defeats. Okay. Why is that? Do well, you guys have really, a lot of Ikeas there? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you couldn't imagine. No, I, I, most big cities have an Ikea. I know it's like this, the meme of Swedes have a lot of Ikea, but it's true. And Swedes are very proud of Ikea. Welcome to episode four of my podcast. I guess the David Ian House Show is what we're going to unofficially call it. Um, I'm here with uh, Gaius Flavius. And uh, what, is your, what is your actual name? Oh, I'm uh, Arthur Hulu. Arthur, Arthur Hulu. like the king and Hulu like the streaming site, but I'm not affiliated with any of those two. You should put that in your bio on Instagram. That's pretty cool. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> not affiliated with the streaming site. <laughs> but yeah, for those of you who don't know, Arthur is a Instagram creator that kind of just took off as of late. And if you've seen the, uh, does your boyfriend always think of the Roman Empire kind of thing? That's, uh, he started that. So I was going to ask you as the caveman, like, what is Rome? But first, I just want to dive in. How does it feel? To, I don't know. It's, um, I'm quite detached uh, from my, from my recent success. I try to really have a stoic mindset about it, like a true Roman, <laughs> um, in the sense that, no, but it just takes a lot of attention away from my everyday life. Um, I've never had like any dreams of becoming like a content creator or an influencer in that sense. So it's not necessarily working within my life goals. So yeah. it's uh, some days it's just more of a distraction than something that I'm actually like appreciating. But it's really fun, uh, just because I get to I get a lot of appreciation in my everyday life, which is nice, and yeah. I also get to talk to a lot of interesting people. Um, you, <laughs> one of them, of sure. course. But it's um, it's really uh, it's it's a bit uh, it's it makes my everyday life a bit more fun. But it also takes a lot of time, um, so it's uh, it's a double edged sword. Yeah, like a gladius. Exactly. I think I know some Roman weapons, but uh, yeah. So your your normal thing is you're you're a reenactor, or what would it be called in Sweden? By the way, you're from Sweden, correct? Yes, exactly. We use the term historiskt återskapande, which means like historic uh, recreation. So, but we okay. also use the term reenactment uh, interchangeably. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm a reenactor basically. It's one of my main hobbies. And your current outfit that you're wearing for the people watching the video is that an auxiliary uniform a centurion uniform it's it's uh, supposed to be like a low ranking centurion impression okay which i am which i'm working on but uh it's not finished yet it's yeah the, the it's never finished uh, whatever you do of course but so uh, you made it up uh, no parts of it uh most of the clothing uh i've made my or i haven't done the weaving and everything but uh, but the stitching uh, but these, uh, the bronze details and the, 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 the chain mail. Yeah. I, I just, no, I tried I to make chain mail one time. It, it, 
it takes a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah, I've tried it as a when I was younger for like LARP stuff. I was I did LARP okay. when I was younger, but yeah, it takes a lot of time, and especially if you want to get them more correct, like with the riveted, uh, riveted rings, that's even more time, and mm-hmm. there are some banging going on which the neighbors won't necessarily appreciate very much. So, <laughs> are you in an apartment? I don't really. Oh yeah, currently yes. Okay, yeah, that would be a little suspect. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask, though, you're Swedish. LARP sounds like a Swedish word. That wasn't what I was going to ask, but it just came to mind. But it's live action role play, right? Yes. Yeah. Being a Germanic language speaking person in a Germanic country, how do you feel playing a Italian or a Roman character all the time? Well, it's I don't really mind it. Uh, some other people might be upset, uh, of course. Sure. Um, so you will, it's, uh, like identity has become a lot more prevalent, Mm -hmm. uh, these days. Um, and I guess it's, it's, it's because it's coming to Europe as well, uh, from us and basically some like Swedes are not necessarily very much into this, uh, entire culture war thing, Mm -hmm. but it's becoming very prevalent with the identitarian movements in Europe. So a lot of Greeks, uh, get really upset, like conservative identitarian nationalistic greeks gets very upset sometimes some italians have issues with it yeah you're you're not an italian but then of course the modern italians are not the same as the ancient romans and the roman empire stretched over such a like vast territory and it's also reenactment it's not i'm not claiming to be a roman i'm not trying to revive uh, the roman empire it's just a hobby for me because uh, I enjoy history, and uh, I usually it's more on the positive side that people from former uh, Roman areas think, "Oh, it's so fun that you're doing this," mm-hmm. and despite that, it's not a part of your heritage. Like you're doing it so well, and you're putting so much time into it. So I get some criticism, but I, I at least what I see, I get a lot more uh, positive things from from people who actually have uh, heritage from the Roman Empire. Yeah, I was kind of gonna like i wanted to segue into that so i'm glad you you answered that first but i guess i more meant as in what got you into being a roman reenactor as opposed to like you know a swedish ski infantry or something i guess that was finland oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) well (laughs) of course i I couldn't basically it's um i've always had a fascination for history Uh uh-huh and uh, and you, I had my pirate period. I have my Viking, uh, Viking, the ancient we all had Egyptians, the pirate period. The, yeah, of course, the Greeks, the knights, everything. But kind of when you were when you were reading more, everything somewhere like connected to the Roman Empire. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily with the, with the pirates that much, but so the Vikings. Oh, they went. Uh, there are some Vikings uh, went as Varangians to fight for the the Byzantines. So they were they were they were the successor of the Roman Empire. Okay, there there are Romans. Oh, you have like the Renaissance. Very interesting things going on. Renaissance history is super interesting. And then like, oh yeah, yeah, they were looking back at what did the what did the ancient Greeks and Romans do? And like, okay, there are there again. And you read all these like you the manuscripts from from the medieval times. Oh, they are all written in Latin. Like, why are they written in Latin? Oh, because this was a, so. It's it's and the church. The church is of course the Roman the Roman Catholic Church is very important during the medieval time. So everything kind of yeah gets back to Rome all the time. And then you okay. Then I have to look more at Rome. And then you find all these fascinating things. And then I just got stuck uh, in antiquity. Um, of course, I've I've been I've been thinking of yeah I should make a proper uh, Viking impression uh, so I can attend the the Viking events and I'm working on a 14th century impression as well because my girlfriend does uh, uh, 14th century reenactment but um, I've I don't know and it's also because very few people reenact uh, the Roman Empire in um, in Sweden I can very much do my own thing. And I'm not like sorted into already established groups that might not share my my visions. One for how to do reenactment, two for how to run groups, etc. So it's um, it's more of a sandbox thing for me, and I I enjoy that because then I can focus on exactly what I want to do. Yeah, and you said your your wife or sorry your girlfriend is a 14th century reenactor. Yes. So that would be, I guess, just late medieval. Yes, basically. Okay. Does that 
make for like an interesting, like, do you guys wear your costumes and talk to each other and do that in the house? I don't know if you can answer no. the rest of that as a political. <laughs> no, no, I, no. It's um, like we are, we are both uh, very modern people uh, okay. with an interest in in living history and historical reenactment. Yeah. Um, so, and we are. I think there are people who are not very good at separating their hobby uh, with with their like. Really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> But they, they, like, so um, you have those people who are like, oh, I wish I, I lived in the medieval times. So I wish I lived in the Roman times. Right. And I'm like, no, I'm very happy with our modern society. Uh, but it's nice to to get a glimpse into what could have, like, w- what was going on there? What do we think was going on? And like, try to to recreate these things. But yeah. Yeah. So when people ask me, oh, if you could like take a time machine back in history, like, where would you go? And I was like, "Yeah, I would. Uh, I would go back yesterday." Uh, really? <laughs> this uh, like there's uh, everything is bad back in the day. We only remember like the the glorious things that people have recorded, but everything else was literally so bad. Like people died from everything. There was no um, from everything. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you get a scratch, and then okay, we don't have and like get a scratch in the wrong place. Yeah. And then you, oh, ho, ho, I died. I just made like that joke the uh, other day at that set I did. <laughs> just die of a paper cut immediately with no Tylenol or Motrin. Of, of course, like like the human body is very tough. It can survive a, a paper cut. But but when there is like, a, when, you, when you're having a bad time and modern medicine can cure that, well, then you're most likely going to live. If you don't get modern medicine, well, then you, you will keep having a bad time. Yeah. Um, but it's also everything is like water toilets, pretty convenient. They didn't have that. Uh, just communication was a lot harder when you're making food. Like I can just go turn on my stove here. I don't have to go fetch firewood and whatever. Uh-huh. It's um, we forget how convenient uh, today's life is. And while I can, I, I can enjoy cooking at events. And I did that for an event. I, I cooked for all the, all our members and it was super fun. But like a traditional cooking way, yeah, yeah exactly. Possible. We made up yeah. a fire and added the ingredients in this big. Uh, I don't know if cauldron is not the the right name. It's like yeah, uh, so yeah, it would work. Yeah. So and just uh, yeah, and chopped some um, chopped some things with very bad knives and. <laughs> but it, it's fun, but combining <laughs> that with actually trying to survive, managing a farm or or being a trader, yeah, it's um, yeah. I'm having a good time in in my modern life here. In the modern day, I get. I always told people when they ask me that question that I would like to go to, like right around the time of Christ in Jerusalem, because you would see so many different cultures coming in and out, yes. and like hearing all sorts of languages. And yeah, there was another pretty big event that happened right there too. But you know, Rome and stuff. But yeah, that's a that's a great point. Like. We have a lot of modern stuff going on today, obviously, but we're doing better than a medieval peasant eating, you know, a gram of porridge. Yeah. yeah. If the like, if uh, if if a rich person from the medieval times could see my apartment <laughs> and all the luxuries I have, he would be like, "Wow, who are you? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm just a regular guy." <laughs> but you're in. Rome. I have like a refri- I have a refrigerator, a TV. Yeah. Uh, I have I have internet. I have uh, super nice uh, cutlery mm-hmm. and uh, super clear, like perfectly clear glasses. And they're bought from IKEA. A lot of them as well, <laughs> so they're like the cheapest, <laughs> cheapest ones. Um, <laughs> Do you guys have really... a lot of IKEAs there? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we you 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 couldn't imagine. No, uh, uh, most big cities have an IKEA. Okay. And it's really, I know it's like this, the meme Swedes have a lot of Ikea, but it's true. Um, and Swedes are very proud of, of Ikea. And although in some countries Ikea are seen as a bit, yeah, it's like the cheap stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Swedes take very much pride in Ikea. And I can go to, to some uh, very well-off um, acquaintances of mine and see Ikea stuff yeah. in, their, in their houses as well. I can go to the poor student and see a lot of IKEA stuff as well. So it's um... yeah, it's um, 
That's interesting. Because, yeah, we, we have it here. It's only in a few cities, like in big cities. There's one in Denver. I think there's one in Brooklyn now. There's one in Atlanta. But anyway, you always go and, like, college kids always have Ikea furniture. I have it in my house. Uh, but, like, the running joke, I mean, I don't, you guys probably understand it too, but Swedish words are a little hard for Americans to pronounce. So it's like that's the Flargisbard table or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, my first date with a, a, a ex of mine was I have a bunch of Ikea meatballs. Do you want some? And I was like, sure. And we just had Ikea meatballs for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah, but they're, they're pretty here. good, actually. So. They are. They're very good. Yeah. So I guess just to – well, I guess we could talk about this too. We can get into Rome after that. But you are a, a politician on the side of this, right? I just learned that the other day. Yes, I am elected to the municipal uh, council in my, in my city. And I also work uh, as a political secretary at the regional level. So I'm basically an assistant to the, to the top politicians. Uh, but that's not, that's, uh, there I'm not elected. But on the okay. municipal level, I am elected. What got you into that? I don't have too many friends here that are in politics. I'm, I'm very bad at doing regular work now. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's been an, I've always been interested in uh, like history, of course, but... Um, but society as a whole, and I've ever since I was a kid uh, had these discussions around the dinner table with my father and and my mother to some extent and some friends and my aunt is also into politics but she's she lives um, she lives quite far away so so she hasn't necessarily been uh, mm. uh, been a big part of that but it kind of just happened in a sense and I grew up in a small city where they they are having a very hard time finding young people who want to engage themselves in the local politics because uh, people with ambitions move away but to I actually stayed other for other cities or other two countries years, yeah to be like this was a, I grew up in a very rural area okay um, they go away to study uh, in the bigger cities they work in other other cities but I I, I stayed for a couple couple years uh, and kind of got into it there um, before I moved. And then I was starting to build a network in the party. And okay, I moved to the new city. I can talk to the party members here. And then, oh, yeah, you, you seem like a nice guy. Maybe you can tag along. Maybe we'll find something for you, etc. So, And then it was, I kind of got tired of politics. So I tried to um, work in the private sector with communication, which has also been like a, something I, I enjoy doing, mm. um, which was super fun. But then COVID came and... Uh, right. They downsized, so my department was kind of slashed, and I. It was the pandemic, and I was oh, I don't have a job. Yeah, and then I was like, I, I had I had some money saved, and I was doing like some small, uh, on the side, uh, on the side job. So like I wasn't starving in in any way. I was actually having quite a good time. But I, then I was I, I need to get a full time like full time job, like something stable, and then um, they were had a, a position in the city where I live now. And they're like, yeah, you can come and work for us. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I I will apply. And then I got the job, and then I got into the on the list. So it says you you vote for people like on a list in the Swedish system. You don't have like one candidate. And it's a and then I got, social democracy over there, right? Well, depend like depends on you ask. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and no. Uh, of course, the, the, like um, we have had the Social Democratic Party has ruled Sweden uh, for many many years. Okay. Um, but we also have a lot of things that are more commonly associated, like with the f with um, we actually have quite strong economic freedom in some ways. In some ways, we do not. For example, we have very high taxes, uh, but taxes on capital gains can be quite low if you if you place them right, etc. Um, mm -hmm. There is not necessarily like some areas are very controlled by the state, and some are like very free. We are very extreme in terms of freedom of speech in many ways and freedom of cultural expressions in general, free press. So we are like, it's, it's a bit of both. Hmm. So it's hard to really put Sweden in a, yeah. in a box in that sense. I know a lot of people here use Sweden as an example, either for or against like a new kind of government here. Yeah. And like, I hear good things. I hear bad things. I know COVID was interesting for you guys with the, the herd mentality thing, but then also yeah. the healthcare system. And, yeah, so yeah, yeah it was weird because all the old people died in the beginning. Yeah, 
And everyone's like, "What? No, you're killing my grandmother. What are you guys doing?" <laughs> and then kind of no one died. So it was super bad in the beginning and then like then it was super good because Swedes Swedes are also very responsible. Mm-hmm. Um in terms of like, yeah, we're not we're not going to host any. So we didn't actually like I kind of would have wish, wished personally for some more restrictions in some areas and some more freedom in other areas but i i'm not the one making decisions and we're also like we'd like to keep our distance naturally so there was this joke um <laughs> where okay we need to keep two meters distance i can't wait until the pandemic is over so we can go back to three meters distance <laughs> some of so, us here would love that too yeah uh so yeah, that's really interesting. I just, I've never known, I assume you're about my age. I can cut this out if you don't want to say it, but. Um, I'm 30, I'm 32. Okay, I'm 31. I figured you're. Okay, right yeah, so it's. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, I guess to, I, I need to ask about the femboys at some point, but with the, <laughs> with sure. your interest in politics, do you have a desire to one day cross the Rubicon and do politics in Rome? I so try not. to spend as uh, I try to spend as little time in Italy as possible. <laughs> Have you been? No, I would. Yeah, I've I've been to Italy. Um, okay. actually, for the last years, I've been there twice. Um, one time with my father last year, and this year I was there for the, uh, for the Natale di Roma, di Roma, the the birthday of Rome in okay. April. Like, I I wouldn't necessarily mind living in Italy, but I probably wouldn't get into politics. And it's okay. better if I want to do like the Roman thing, I should run for the European Parliament instead. Um, oh, right. That's the thing. But I don't really do. have any ever, any interest in doing that either. Yeah. I don't like Brussels as a city. <laughs> Why is I don't that? Like the... Oh, it's dirty. Is it? <laughs> it's like, yeah. But it's, I mean, it's it's uh, the European Parliament is very important. And a lot of people, especially Swedes, like underestimate how important uh, the European Union is for for even our domestic uh, domestic policies and the laws and everything. But yeah. um, I, I like the EU, or mo- like I don't like everything with the EU, but I like, I like the general idea of the European Union, but um, I'm not invested enough to, to go in there. Yeah. Uh, I might change my mind in, in, in the future, then people can go back, oh, you said in this interview, like back in 2000. <laughs> 23 that you were that you hate the <laughs> you hate Brussels what oh no <laughs> I uh I grew up in New York like Long Island specifically and it's a very Italian and Irish immigrant area uh Jewish as well and Hispanic now too uh but my neighbors were Italian I grew up like their no no was my babysitter I heard Italian every day and like being yelled at in Italian when you don't know it is you straighten up and you do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I just always found it interesting, like when I talk about it or when I'm in history classes back in college. Like, I grew up with Romans. It's like just like what what is the diaspora of what Rome used to be now, which is kind of funny. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is in my high school, middle school, sorry, elementary school in New York, everyone's last name ended in a vowel. It was like Damasi or Dimaggio, all sorts of stuff like that. And then I moved down south to Tennessee. And it was just Smith and like, you know, Smith Williamson, (laughs) things like that. So it's just a, I I really appreciate the culture. Yeah. Yeah. No, but there, there are so many good, like, and Italy has been such an important part of medieval Europe as well. And especially during, during the Renaissance, both for like art, art, medicine, architecture, a lot of those things uh, come from Italy. So I'm, I'm not going to just because modern Italy is a bit of a mess doesn't mean that we should not appreciate um, what the area has contributed to uh, to the world historically. And uh, like taking world history classes in, in college, uh, just was, history was, I did, did anthropology and history uh, in Spanish, but the, just how much Italy, yeah, played a role with the Pope being there and the Holy Roman Empire was mostly Italy for a while. And then, you know, the Byzantine split and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Rome and the fall of it definitely is what marks the beginning of the Middle Ages, I think, in my mind. So it is a pretty important place in the world and world history. Absolutely. What is, so 
we'll get we'll get back to the fanboys. I'll leave that so people keep listening. But uh, Republic or Empire? Where you at on that? <laughs> Why can't we have both? <laughs> <laughs> no, but those are of of course. Um, the fun thing in Sweden is that we we call we like we kind of say Romariket, which is like the 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 Roman Reich or the German word oh, wow. for like the entire. It can mean the the Roman Kingdom, the Roman Republic. And the and the Roman Empire, so it's like a loose term we use for right. like ancient Rome, and it's it's um, and Swedes in general don't think about it as as uh, like the difference, like how how really different the Republic was, and what really happened in the Empire, because it's not really in our minds, and Swedes don't don't. Like since we don't really have Roman heritage in that way, we don't necessarily study it as much, and people are not as invested in in Roman history. So it's kind of hard to discuss Roman history with Swedes. Uh, it 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 works surprisingly well, but I I find that is much easier uh, with people from other parts of the world because they didn't uh, get too much past Germany to even get towards Sweden. No, I guess. yeah, there are there there are archaeological finds. In in like Denmark and southern Sweden, uh, more than just like coins, because coins you find every like you have found Roman coins in Japan, uh, so coins doesn't necessarily count in that regard. But you have found things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, trade over distances, like weapons, uh, mm. glass. Uh, well, those would be traded over distances, of course. But there there has been trade. Uh, with the Romans, there are a lot of evidence that points to p- proto Swedes and proto Danes uh, having been fighting with the Romans or against the Romans. We don't know because you have some weapon graves with weapons that are very Roman hmm. and like, arrowheads, which are made like in the Roman style. You also have some of like these very old uh, forts built in the style of late late antiquity uh, forts as well. Yeah. Or fortifications, rather. So there is apparent that Scandinavians have had contact with Romans, but there is no evidence of Roman settlements or or uh, attempts at at um, Romans conquering Sweden or northern Denmark. Sure. In my experience, like archaeological, I do prehistoric archaeology, so it's out of my wheelhouse. But from what I remember in college in historic art class and just from reading new papers. Coins and domestic house items seem to be the most common things you find very widespread away from their central culture. But with Rome being so militaristic, it makes sense then that like you'd see the ripples of it in their fortification architecture and things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the weapons as well. Right. Um, and there's like a, a very like very Roman cavalry mask found on Gotland, which is a, a big island outside of the the southeast coast of Sweden. So there are some very specific specific. There is a cloak with, that looks very Roman with some Roman glasses found in the south of Sweden, Örmölla. Um So it's um, there has been contact, and maybe even we don't know if it was trade or more, but mm-hmm. most likely Swedes and Danes have been in Roman territories and fought. Yeah, um, or just traded heavily in in weapons. The interconnectedness or interconnectedness of the classical world is pretty mind blowing to me because I know there's like a Chinese report of essentially describing what Rome is or how to get there, and then there's Rome, there's silk in Rome. I think they found at yep. one point too. So yep. there was a first indirect contact between the Chinese um, and the oh, Romans. So you know about that. Yes, I would love to. Um, know more. Yeah. And uh, and they traded uh, they traded along the Silk Road, but usually with um, with Persian middlemen, right? Um, which um, made a lot of money because silk, like silk, would be expensive, of course, in China as well. But it was an absolute luxury in in Rome, especially in the early days. It, silk became a bit more more common over time. And there was, uh, I don't know in, in what what's, what the source is for this, but there's like this, the Chinese want to go, yeah, we should trade, try and trade directly with the Romans. Uh, or if it was a Roman who wanted to trade there, I don't remember what way it was. Uh, and the, the Persians say, no, no, it's too far. Don't, <laughs> uh, you know, it's going to take so, such a long time. 
because they wanted to keep being the, the middleman. Yeah. So. Huh. And the silk production didn't didn't start properly in Europe until the until the Middle Ages. So it yeah. was always a, a traded luxury. And for a period, there was uh, such an immense trade that it created a, a, a trade imbalance. So the emperor wanted like to ban, or if, if it was at the, uh, during the late Republic, or if it was the early Empire, I don't remember. I, silk is not my expert, field of expertise. Sure. Uh, but <laughs> but they, then they said, oh yeah, we need to, like we uh, don't, don't wear silk, that's, that's bad. And they had some laws against it even. Sumptuary, is it called sumptuary laws? Not sure. But what would be the the reasoning behind that? Is just to uh, b- because like you so um, so you get a trade imbalance in in the sense that you send a lot of gold to China mm-hmm. to get silk back, but we are not selling like if like the, if the Romans oh yeah okay we just ship tons of marble to China and they pay like tons of gold for that, but that's not happening. So there is a lot of of money being shipped out of Rome to China for silk that is not necessarily very useful on a societal level, mm. which means that uh, the liquidity uh, for Rome becomes, because the money goes out of circula- circulation. Yeah. Um, and that can be damaging for, the, uh, damaging for the economy. Did you go to school for history? I never asked that, I, I guess. No, I, I've, I've never studied. I did some, uh, like... Um, economics and um okay poli- politics uh thing political science uh yeah. exactly i okay. never finished my exam though which is a bit embarrassing but uh, maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll do that another day the you were making me think there though with the uh you know the the big massive trade that they all had then like marco polo was italian later on in the i guess that was pre-renaissance or just yeah. about the time of it Columbus was Italian, so like trade has always been at the heart of Italy, but I guess it's because it's very central to everything in the Mediterranean in Europe. Yes, and they can get everywhere with the ship. Because uh-huh. um, like if you're in the middle of the Mediterranean, you can go both east and west uh, quite easily. Um, like to Spain or... To- the yeah, Levant. Okay. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. So, so and Italians have, have always, like since they were a very advanced... Compared to compared to a lot of other like compare 13th 14th century Italy with like 13th century Sweden yeah well, it's like, <laughs> just Iron Age so, tribes yeah ex- <laughs> yeah. Ex- uh, yeah well they, they they were they were Sweden were up and coming at this time but oh, okay. still very very far from from the Italians and it was also a, an, an intellectual centra and they had a lot of money and resources of course um, so it's not surprising like they they could finance like these big big projects and they were also intellectual enough to come up with these these ideas and wanting to to do yeah. these things big projects being expanding realm every direction yeah basically <laughs> um do you speak any latin cuz do you have to for your other no reasons? very very little like yeah. i i know carpe diem but no, oh, right. <laughs> we, like i tr- like i try to i have never studied latin and i it's not nece- like it's not necessarily Either really for me to learn Latin on any any more advanced level than mm-hmm. than some basic stuff, I try to pick up things, and I have some like Latin study books here. Uh, oh, they're in the other they're in the other bookshelf, but um, and I have a friend who studies Latin uh, at at university, so I'm slowly, very 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 slowly becoming a bit more knowledgeable in Latin, but it's not a priority for me. Yeah. Um I would rather like spend that time like learning how to sue better or or uh, l- do more research, uh read history books etc because that really gives me gives me a better grasp and there's always someone else who can translate the sources. Hmm. Um so a professor isn't going to sue my clothes. <laughs> but he can, right. he can tra- he can translate the he can translate the ancient Greek and the Latin. Yeah. Huh. So at at a reenactment what or what was the Swedish word for it sorry uh yeah we yeah, we we use reenactment as well uh, so what is cuz I've been to civil war reenactments here revolutionary war reenactments um our history doesn't go too deep uh well european history here but what would 
Like what does the a, a daily thing in Taylor, what's a normal event for you look like? It's very different. Um because it's, it depends very much on the focus of, of the groups as well. I know uh, in the US, the, the civil war reenactment is very focused around certain battles, for example. And there, then there is some living history with like the camps as well. But as I've understood, a lot of that is, is focused uh, on the military. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of heavy military focus in the Roman reenactment as well. But there is also a lot of opportunity for, for other things. Sadly, not as much as I would have wished it would be because I think there's just so much interesting things going on in the civilian era with all the sources we have for everything from cutting stones to cooking that not a lot of other time periods have. But Roman reenactment isn't necessarily a lot about the battles because it's not as fun looking at just shield walls bouncing at each other. Yeah, Uh, It's also a lot more dangerous than... um, than like standing at a distance and and like not shooting at each other, yeah. With empty, what do you call it? Like empty um... blanks. Yeah, blanks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because I that's I think that's really fun to watch and people like fall down and there and then there's the bayonets and then comes the horses in the background. I think it it makes for a really good show when you have two sides battling mm-hmm. each other. That's mm-hmm. not necessarily. Uh, very common in um, it happens usually then it's the romans versus some barbarian tribes um but you might just as well do a roman civil war it happened um hmm. but it's more focused when when it comes to shows the fighting is mainly done then by by gladiators okay. which is actually fun to watch because a lot of these people put a lot of uh, eff- uh, a lot of effort into making either choreographed fights Mm-hmm. Uh, or actually having a system for like when to take hits and where to hit each other, etc., yeah. uh, which makes for very good, uh, very good shows. But uh, at at a military focused reenactment event, uh, there is mostly focus on like showing the equipment, showing the formations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, to really show like the discipline of the Roman army and how they moved. But then, for example, I was at an event in Belgium where we. Um, where we where we had these shows, but there was also a twenty four seven camp, mm-hmm. um, which was yeah, it was supposed to be immersive. But for me, as yes, I've I've done LARPing and live action role play before, which is like a hundred percent immersive, or yeah. well, nothing is ever hundred percent, of course. But sure. so, but it, it's it's fun because you have these morning exercises. You eat you eat the food, um, you sleep in the tents, etc. Um, which is which is quite fun, and then you also had a lot of other people like craftsmen. Yeah, you had the gladiators, of course, and some people who did like more. Of the, there was like a land surveyor uh, showing uh, had like this um, showing how they did land surveying back in the day, etc. So it's um, yeah, quite interesting. That's the kind of stuff that really got me into archaeology and anthropology in general. Is just understanding because especially in prehistory, there's no massive battles or things that we can know about but you're getting into what the daily life of an average person was and even with historic archaeology too and i think that helps for me at least understand and appreciate history more because someone like you that's just you know cooking food for the army or cooking food for their roman family and like the tools they used and how they did it that kind of really gives you more aspects of their culture less so than just hitting each other with shield walls and testuro, yeah. yeah. And that's also why why I like the living history aspect outside of the military, um, because as you say, like you get to discover the everyday life of people, and you also by learning about how they were doing stuff, you also learn um, about like you learn about yourself, and you learn about what skills you lack in a situation where oh no. Like I have no water and electricity. What do I do? <laughs> well, I've been at a lot of couple of Roman events. I can just make a porridge yeah. with some firewood here. No, but so it's um you learn the basic skills that was like necessarily for survival. I was also in the Boy Scouts as a kid. Which well, you guys um, have that too? Uh, yeah, we don't call it Boy Scouts, we just call them scouts because okay. we're very like gender neutral in, in gotcha. but it's but it's um 
it's uh, it's the, basically the same concept. And I've learned a lot from, which also things that I've I had had um, very much use for in reenactment in those situations as well, where I have to do things without the modern modern stuff. So yeah. it's kind of I've uh, also something I've I've realized with reenactment, it that it combines so many of my other other hobbies into one. So I like reading about history and doing research about history. Uh, I can do uh, I do that with the reenactment. I like crafting. Like mm-hmm. I like sewing and working with my hands. Uh, not that I'm very good at it, but I enjoy it. Um, and that I can do with the reenactment. I can have like the 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 Boy Scout life, living in a tent, making making fires and stuff. Oh, I got that in reenactment as well. Yeah. So it's I combine, uh, and especially when I can the things I do now with my social media, I, I I make memes and fun videos, and I can use all my reenactment stuff. Oh, that's another part that can go into the. So it's really a combination of all my other hobbies into into reenactment, which is uh, maybe why I'm still because usually I grow bored with stuff pretty fast. Same, <laughs> but uh, but the reenactment Roman reenactment I've been keeping it intensely for is it like four years soon I think. Oh wow! Okay. Which is uh, apart from apart from Warhammer, that's the only hobby I've managed <laughs> to keep for more than like two years. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. I uh, I, I wouldn't say I, like I'm a primitive skills or you know paleolithic skills demonstrator or reenactor in any way, but I do notice because I just show it for the anthropological side, like the stone tools yeah. and making fire. People are drawn to that because it's something for stone tools at least. It's something everyone had to do for two million years, yeah. and now no one knows how to do it. Um, but then making fire with the spindle and stuff like everyone always stops and comments or if I'm making a point, uh, yeah, I find that stuff to do really well. And I think, I mean, you blew up because of this stuff too. And at Rome, of course, everyone thinks about it once a day. So (laughs) they're gonna, your stuff is just appealing. No, but it's also, I think it's the combination between, because I've, I had my account for, I started it in like March March 2000, I think. Oh, wow. Um, like on Instagram? Yeah, exactly. And for a very long time, like literally no one cared. But it's not like anyone cared about other reenactments, reenactors either, because there are some Roman reenactors who has amazing gear, uh, who has been doing the hobby for a long time, who are very knowledgeable in the field. But they're not reaching a lot of followers because they don't understand how social media work. Or they don't like they don't care to learn, and that's fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. Because that's if that's not your focus, uh, and if they're putting their time into other stuff, that's totally fine. But for me, who has like I've been I've been working a bit with communication. It's been an interest, but I struggled when I did only reenactment content. Like I posted photos. So if you scroll back in my feed, mm-hmm. like uh, like for like more than one and a, one and a yeah. half years, there are there are no fun videos. Uh, it's just, or there are some really bad ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but then it's just reenactment photography and actually a lot of good posts uh, that are a bit educational as well. So I'm, I'm, my plan is to get back to that, making more educational content again. Yeah. But, but I, I, despite having like, not being a very, uh, not, not having the best gear, not being the most experienced reenactor by kind of. Uh, doing social media the way it's supposed to be, I could still be up having the same followers and 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 the same amount of interactions as as the most like the most experienced, um, the the most well regarded centurions, uh, <laughs> centurion reenactors. Which for me, like yeah, I'm I'm catching up with the big fish now. I'm doing well. And then I started to do like the more of the more of the comedy, combining comedy right. with history. Um, and really trying to mix, like doing the Monty Python style, doing some very intellectual things in a mm-hmm. very, very dumb way. I never thought of it like that, Monty Python. Yeah. Anyway, they, they are big. They have always been like a very big inspiration for me in terms of comedy. They don't necessarily have t- anything to do with the content I'm making now, mm-hmm. but it's it's uh, taking intellectual subjects and and turning them as dumb as possible. Um, which I, I try to do uh, in many ways. I noticed with the uh, the one you had, well, the Jenna Ortega one was funny. Uh, yeah. I think that's the first one I saw. And then um, 
the fanboy ones, I think I saw two, but the one where yes. you were like, if the Roman Empire had conquered Australia, yeah. it, it <laughs> took just... me a second. And then I was like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> but that also drives engagement because other people then had to sit there and stare and let it replay a few times. Yeah, and that, exactly. that's how you blew up, man. Yeah. Yeah. To, to explain, it was basically just uh, I turned a. Uh, it was uh, from from one of the events where the guys were marching. I just turned the video upside down because, and of course, it. Australia is in the southern hemisphere. Like, if you look at the globe, they're going to be upside down. Right. And that's like a boomer joke that no one makes anymore because it's like it's so like it's such an old joke. Yeah. That it's kind of people have kind of forgot about the ups, Australians are upside down joke because it's not as funny. Like it's not fun. It's it's been done so many times. But if no one is doing it, like people are gonna think it's fun anyway. Yeah. Um, I did at least. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. And then the other ones of yours too that I, uh, what I can't remember exactly what they were. I mean, they're all great. But just when you have what I respect is that like when you're doing like the the thirst trappy kind of ones, uh, yeah. but you use a trending sound. And it's just three seconds, three to five seconds. Like that's yeah. all you got to do to blow up sometimes. And you're so creative with it because I just wouldn't think about it. But no, but I think that's I'm because I think and one thing I'm like very tired about. Uh, like I understand people. I, I get I get tired of 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 it, but I really understand people's frustration. It's when they're like, "Oh, the algorithm is punishing me again." Oh, yeah. oh no! The algorithm is oh no! The algorithm, the algorithm, that the algorithm, that today. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and, and and like I understand the frustration, but the thing is, like, either you work with the algorithm and you win, or you don't work with the algorithm and you lose. It's like okay, I'm I bought a new like uh, sports bike, um, and I, the, it's gonna go so fast now. Why? But why is it going so slow? Yeah, because you're like you're in the ditch. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good your bike is because you're riding in the ditch. So you can hate the algorithm as much as you want. But if you like, if, if like uh, just, uh, and that's all like, that's the problem with, and I don't like, I, I don't like, is the, the optimal type of video I want to do the thirst traps with a trending sound and a dumb caption? No. Right. But, but it's also makes that if I can, if, if people can get to my account, and see the things that I put a bit more effort into, right. especially when I put some intellectual effort into it. Yeah, that's that's the way to reach them, because otherwise you're just gonna see the. Oh yeah, there's oh there's another dancing girl. Oh there's another dancing girl. Oh there's a cat. Oh there's another cat. Oh here's a cool car, and there's another dancing girl. Like you're f like, if I can get in between them mm -hmm. with a Roman thirst trap, and they start to follow me. I'm I'm gonna show up in more people's feeds and and draw them into like the real content. So it's I don't like doing it to be honest, mm -hmm. but it's a compromise uh, that I have to do to grow. That's a good way to put it, man. Because I I stopped doing like the trending things after like 2021 on TikTok because it just it felt goofy to me. Yeah. But whenever I do them, it does so well. So I need to just bite the bullet. And do yeah. that, uh, and yeah, I respect you for that. Yeah, no, but I don't like doing it, and I think it's dumb. And I and sometimes like, yeah, this is so cringe. Like, what am I? It's like, <laughs> is this <laughs> right. what I use? Is this what I use my brain for? But I'm like, yeah, if I gain some followers, they can see the other fun content as well. So, and that's a that's a great outlook on it too, because other people will ask me like, you know, how'd you do that? Or like, David, not that I blew up, but like, he's the He's the account to follow for archaeological yeah. stuff or dog stuff. And then my answer is you, you just got to do it. Like you, you just got to post stuff and you'll figure it out as you go. And people yeah. will let you know what they don't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very, yeah. I mean, th then usually, and that's all, that's also something I look at. I try to find, I try to find the, uh, cause I look at the statistics and the insights. Okay. Um, and I try to figure out like why. Like, like, say I have like ten videos with over, over five hundred thousand views, in like the last six months. What, like, what do these ones have in common? Mm -hmm. Do all of them have trending sounds? No. Half of them have, but the other half doesn't. 
Is is uh, are they a certain length? Is it a specific type of joke? Uh, some of the jokes are similar, but it's it's so it's you kind of have to connect the dots and see what you can reuse. And yeah. then I also go and look at okay, which are my like ten worst performing videos? Oh, here's this joke that my father thought was hilarious, mm-hmm. and my friend and my other friend. This is another one that uh, he thought was hilarious, but they have like yeah, two thousand likes and yeah. like. 25 30k views uh, which is still a lot for for many people but for account that in my size it's literally nothing yeah so i don't post the stand up often for that reason too cuz it, it's just not my usual thing so i think they don't do so well cuz people don't realize that's the same account or they just don't don't like the humor i guess is the main thing yeah. but with yours i have noticed it is like if i'm scrolling occasionally it's just the one like it was words over the coliseum i remember that one but then it's you front and center and the camera and people know it oh it's that guy yeah yeah but i I also try to experiment and this is something i'm actually doing uh, like at the end of the year uh so i'm i'm gonna try to do a lot of new things okay and not just like do the same skits or the same format all the time but actually try to use like these tiktok templates or or whatever it is and uh try more captions that are on on screens from because when i'm away uh, i do like if i'm in italy if if i'm at a museum i bring my camera and i i do some of these panoramic um, slides yeah um and then just see what i can use them for and a lot like for example my my latest uh success with the the socrates goat thing uh, i don't know if you saw it I can't remember um, if I did. I was I posted it like last week, and so which was just one of these uh, TikTok templates, which I literally put no effort into, but that blew up and has like six million uh, six million views. The goat one. Oh, the with the little cats, or the Socrates go by. Anyway, yeah, exactly. I'll find it later. But yeah, yeah. I mean, just looking at your feed right now too, it's like you can see it's just you front and center in most of them. Yeah. And that does well. And yeah, now I can see the reenactment photos down at the the back. But yeah, I usually try but, to like fill to to re- because I kind of want the reenactment feed because that's originally what like my account is for is to bring more people into the hobby and to mm-hmm. uh, to the Roman Empire. Um, <laughs> but I guess it's it looks pretty narcissistic uh, uh, the the feed because it's it's very much uh, it's very much me. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I made that nod because not that I'm saying yours is. That's just something I've struggled with too. If it's just yeah. pictures of me all the time, it's you know, it just becomes a me account, not about dogs and people. Yeah. But um, but, it, but it's, it, it it's works. hard. It's yeah, it's yeah, it's hard with the balance as well because I kind of want to post more about other people in my group, but they don't they don't think content. A lot of them. Mm-hmm. Um, which is totally fine because I like, I am, I am the extremist. I think content all the time. Um, and they're just, they, they don't, which means that like, I, I, I'm, I'm both uh, like, I, I can be both the guy running around with the camera and the guy wanting to be on the photos. Um, yeah. so that gets a bit, now we have a, a guy in our group who, uh, who is a, a very good photographer. He was away in Canada for one and a half years, but he's coming back now. So get a proper proper photographer and That's there's good. another guy uh, as well who we try to take photos of each other as well but it's um having a having like a, a private photographer that has like your your mission at this event is to just take photos of me and of people interacting with me and that understands um, your brand kind of yeah exactly yeah. so that i can get a hundred photos that i can post over the coming three months but it's 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 um it's a very not Swedish way to think. Um, so it's kind of and and I'm like um, it like it's it's um, yeah it's yeah and you have to find it's because in other hobbies that, people like, do capitalist or like what do you mean by that? Oh no, no, I have I have no problem with 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 that at all. It's it's more like a it's more like the um, in Sweden you're you're supposed to. Um, I don't know. We have something called Jantelagen, uh, which is basically about like don't believe that you are something or that you are someone, okay. and just stick to yourself and don't don't brag, 
like this a very uh, a very destructive mindset in many ways but also uh, it makes uh, it, it like pe- Swedes don't get hubris as often hmm. i think as well. and we are not as outgoing or or um, aggressive in many situations because we realize our own own limits and it's a cultural as a cultural thing to stay cool okay um that's not something i've noticed here as an american but then again sweden's not really in our forefront of yeah. culture <laughs> it's uh, it's not by the way is english compulsory for you guys or do you just speak it cuz it's spoken there it is uh, it is compulsory uh, wow. and we start to study it quite early but then there are of course people who are have more exposure to english than others and are better um and you will really see the diff like Swedes, most Swedes, even like my father speaks good English. My mother, my mother speaks speaks decent English too, um, and older people. Um, but like Swedes are very good at at talking about the weather, ordering food, asking for directions, etc. But as soon as you get into the academic English, it's mm-hmm. embarrassing. Um, and you see many, so many academic texts written by Swedes in English that are just, yeah. Yeah. Because we kind of, we kind of get into like, it's like this false sense of superiority and that Swedes also, oh, you Swedes are so good at speaking English. Oh yeah. How come? How come? It's not even your native language. Like it's another, oh, da, 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 da. And then we're like, yeah, we're so good. So we don't understand that we have to practice English on another level than just everyday, yeah. everyday uh, small talk, um, and that's that's when people get up to like college level that they realize, oh, I have no idea how to write academic English, hmm. and then they're they're already so far behind. While in other countries who are not necessarily as good English speakers, they really have to force themselves. Like if they want an international career, they're going to force themselves to read more advanced books. They're going to learn to to write uh, academic English or business English. But you don't really have that mindset in Sweden because we believe we are so good at English, which we are. Yeah, yours up is to, phenomenal. Uh, up to a certain up to a certain level. Yeah, but I I speak English every day, and I, I I've had more exposure uh, to English than than I think the normal. Would you say that's because of the reenactments in Instagram or just from school? Um, yeah, I, I studied like the international baccalaureate program um, at high school. So I spoke English every day. I've also, uh, my father has been uh, always been like very insistent on me uh, learning English. So he has kind of uh, given me exposure to English and like, yeah, read English books, etc. cetera. Um, and I also played computer games for for a long uh, while with people from other countries. Um, so f- I can't remember a day where I didn't speak English at all. And also uh, my girlfriend is German and my German is bad. So we communicate mostly in English as well. One of the questions um, I had for you was how many languages do you speak? So it's three. Um, I, on, I, I speak English and sw- like Swedish is my mother tongue, of course. And I, I, I'm fluent in English. Uh, I studied Spanish for six years. Um, oh wow! Okay, in school, um, and I'm pretty okay when it comes to reading, but I've lost it a lot when it comes to talking. As soon as I kind of get going, if I talk Spanish for an hour, I kind of get into it, especially if I've if I had a beer or two. <laughs> sure, <laughs> but, I, but I barely drink anymore, so it's like yeah. it's going to be hard. But but. Um, um, but uh, the, my passive Spanish is pretty okay, but it's not as I, it was pretty good uh, ten years ago. Yeah. Um, and also, my father speaks and my stepmother speaks uh, Spanish fluently. Uh, what would well. be the the purpose for that in Sweden? I guess you're not too close to Spain or Latin America. Um, yeah, this is a, this. My father has worked in 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 Central America uh, um, okay. when I was uh, very very small. And he kind of kept up the Spanish as well, to some extent. And my stepmother is from Poland. And she she is very good with languages. Like, she's phenomenal with languages. And she just wanted to learn Spanish. Um, so she did. And now she speaks better than than both me and my father, by far. Wow. Um, and they also, my father and her, they travel a lot in, in, in South America and Central America as well. I 
studied Spanish and obviously middle school, high school. And then I did academic in college and was like, wow, this is more difficult. Cause it's like doing academic English in college. But, um, I listen to Latin music every day. Like just if I'm listening to music, it's not the whole thing I listen to, but that helps me. Yeah. And if I'm singing along, you're doing like the X, like you can practice it. But anyway, uh, I dream in it sometimes. And sometimes when I'm, I just force myself to think in it when I'm trying to think through something in your mind, like what, what do you obviously Swedish probably, but do you find yourself dreaming in English or Spanish? I've, I've, I've not, I've never dreamt in Spanish. Okay. I guess there's been dreams where I'm exposed to Spanish or people speaking Spanish, but I've never, but in both English and Swedish and my dreams have become more English over time, which is weird because I don't necessarily speak more English than I did yeah. five years ago or 10 years ago. But I um, was going to segue that to it's probably to me, I speak Spanish every day on Instagram with people that just message me in Spanish yeah. or I hear a lot of Spanish when I roll through reels. But do you get a lot of, I'm assuming mostly English DMs, right? Yeah, people write to me in all manner of languages. And like sometimes if it's in Spanish, like I try to reply. Yeah. Uh, if it's French, I just use Google Translate. So people <laughs> write to me in Italian as well. Uh, and some people write to me in Greek and then I have to tr Google Translate it. But those are usually not very positive messages. So I kind of don't reply to them. Uh, um, back to what we were talking about before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's also like the reason for me learning Spanish was this, like if if I could redo, like I don't regret uh, studying Spanish, but, but when I was a kid, first of all, like my father is, I speak Spanish um, and he, he was working in, in Spanish for a short while when I was a kid. He was working in Spanish. He was working in, in Central America. Um, and I also had like the idea of, yeah, I want to move to the US because that's like, that's the best country in the world. Uh, so I wanted to to move to Florida, and oh, uh, brave. And, uh, yeah, everyone <laughs> speaks Spanish there apparently. So uh, so learning Spanish is uh, is important. But then I never moved to Florida. Um, so uh, and then in, now I have a German girlfriend. So if I had have learned German instead, that would have been a lot better. But Swedes don't study German anymore. They want to study like Spanish for some reason. I mean, yeah. No one knows really why. Shakira, and because yeah, yeah, well, she was never that like. Of course, everyone knows who she is, but I don't know it. Yeah, they can go to, they can go to Barcelona or whatever, or mm -hmm. they can speak to people at in the Canary Islands. I don't know what the reason yeah. is, but <laughs> if everyone would learn German, like if 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 Swedes would study German, and become engineers, then Sweden would be very well off. But they don't do that, so <laughs> they're having a bad time. <laughs> Uh, is that because of World War II they stopped, or is it just you know Germans not it's just kind of fallen out of? Yeah, kind of no, I think I think it's a big part, uh, or parts of it is because um, the Swedes were infatuated with the with the French back in the 18th century. So they sp spoke French at court, and everyone's yeah, France France is the best. And then the France kind of got the got a bit wiped by uh, by the Prussians. So Swedes were like, yeah, let's go Germany. Wow. <laughs> What an eye. So, uh, and you have, it's also uh, an important academic language in Sweden. So if I, if I look at hundred year old academic texts from Sweden about archeology span from the Iron Age, a lot of it is written in, in German. I was told that if you were to do classical archeology, span you got to learn German. Yeah. Um, it's and, a very important academic uh, language in, in that field. I switched to um, rocks. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> smart uh, move. And then, <laughs> then kind of, then kind of there were, were two wars and it's America strange. kind of took over the cultural, they become the cultural epicenter of the world. Right. Uh, so Swedes were, now we're like, Swedes hate America, um, but the, uh, we have so much cultural influences and we want to be like the Americans so bad. So yeah. it's a bit of a weird, uh, weird relation. I assume you guys get a lot of American TV and movies. and Yeah, like, and uh, since we have been very, like uh, early uh, with the internet for for large parts of of society, um, and also been quite like had enough money to invest in the tech needed. We have been very early on, like a lot of Swedish uh, YouTube uh, YouTube watchers. We have Netflix, um, everything, and we get all the big the the Hollywood 
the, all the Hollywood movies come here as well, of course. So, uh, yeah. and we are too small of a country to really produce a lot of culture ourselves. And the pr- problem with like producing culture in Sweden is that like the taxes are so high, so people don't necessarily have that much disposable income to put into culture. Um, there are also you can't really get any tax breaks for sponsoring culture in that sense that you can do in mother, many other cultures. And there is also like a, a we claim to have no no uh, politicians should, shouldn't get involved in the in in the production of culture. But you basically have these like checklists that the politicians set up for what gets funding and what doesn't get funding. Sure. Um, so it's the culture is in a sense very controlled. So then it's just a lot better to just get whatever comes from America. Seems to be the case for most countries. Yeah. It's just odd as an American because we have that mentality that, you know, the world revolves around us, but it's it's just weird when you speaking to you in fluent English and, you know, like other people yeah. in Japan no, or Korea it's, know. It's, yeah. uh, no, but America has such an immense influence on my everyday life uh, huh. in terms of, of, of culture and language. And a lot of media I consume, and like a lot of my favorite creators uh, on Instagram are American as well. So, I mean, it's like you can't, you can, let's, you know, you th- you think about the Roman Empire every day, but I literally think about America or Americans, yeah, every day. I speak there. No, it's not necessarily their language in a sense because it's the the British language, but I kind of I have more exposure to American English than I have to British English. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I was gonna say the day I want to segue into the uh, the Roman Empire question thing, but the day someone asked me that, uh, like, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And one, I we had been talking together, like yep. you and I, for a few months. I didn't know that was you at first, um, but I was thinking, like, in Spanish, Spanish is like the sec, or I think. Portuguese is the most spoken language in South America, but in the second most spoken language in North in the Americas is Spanish. Uh, it's a Latin language. The Romans like conquered the Iberian Peninsula, and then you know they then came here and colonized the Americas. So the entire indigenous population mixes with them and speaks a Latin language, which is Spanish. Uh, and like that's the kind of stuff I think about on the daily. And it's just, it's so interesting because that's still a lasting Roman legacy in a way. Um, but that was the day, like I had been thinking about that when I was driving and then getting that text when I got out of the car, I was like, huh, I do think about it every day. <laughs> it's like, what, what led you to asking that question? Or like, was it just- No, it's mean? like the, the idea that, uh, that men are obsessed with the Roman empire is nothing new. Um, like you can find like Reddit threads, like why are men obsessed with the Roman empire? Or huh. there's like this meme, which is one of my favorites where, uh, it's like from 2001 where someone writes like, oh, um, uh, men would rather learn everything about the Roman empire than go to therapy. Yeah. Uh, which is so true. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was like a Swedish influencer who did like a, a similar thing like a year ago, but, um, so it was discussed a bit in Sweden, but like Swedes don't care about the Roman Empire, so nothing happened. And then I kind of like just did one of those because uh, I had I I was basically in between, uh, in between uh, events, so I didn't have a lot of pictures to post. So I was just yeah, I'll take some of these clips I filmed in in Italy and ask some some questions. So I had this like if you. I made some just text with like, oh, if you if you see this, you are either uh, interested in the Roman Empire or in fanboys. I yeah. did like the, <laughs> I did like the one if uh, ladies uh, ask your ask your boyfriend if uh, which is his uh, favorite favorite Roman Empire. If he doesn't uh, if he doesn't uh, say any one of these five, and I listed like five emperors. Mm-hmm. Um, but I omitted some of the good emperors, of course, to get some extra discussion. Then, like, <laughs> then you should then you should run. And I did that one as well. And I think it may, might have been some more. And they were kind of um, performing pretty well, all of them. Uh, so I think, yeah, maybe I should do this. Like, it's not kind of the content I want to do, but apparently, I like it works quite well. And there's a lot of fun comments 
Yeah. Um, Cause some, sometimes it's just worth, it's worth posting just to read the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, the and problem is if they, the algorithm yeah, too. yeah. And problem is if they become too popular, I don't have time to read all the comments. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a, it's a double edged sword again here, <laughs> but, um, then it kind of, I was at the event in Belgium and this kind of started to blew up and I it kind of didn't realize it because I didn't check my phone that much. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, then uh, when I got home again, like they, they could, it really like exploded. And I saw it, I saw it on Twitter. Someone talked about it and referenced my video and, um, yes, then they, they, they People started like, oh, it's oh, it's, uh, it's the, so people started asking me, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> right. I like, I never stopped. <laughs> it's, it's, and then I got, uh, I got some interviews in some newspapers. I saw that, um, yeah. uh, and that was super fun. And then it kind of just ran away from there. But since it was something that was very good because. Or it's 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 bad and good at the same time because since I wasn't the face of the campaign, so to speak, because it's uh, the original video was quite detached from the global trend. Mm -hmm. Like it has like two million views, so people have have been looking at it, but it's not. It's the the Roman Empire hashtag had like a billion mm -hmm. uh, billion hits or something, and it was discussed by everyone. Like Bill Gates did it, Elon Musk did it. Uh, Ryan That's Gosling crazy. did it, uh, and you see these things, and it's like I'm not the first person to have this this idea about men being obsessed with the Roman Empire, but it's kind of it's obvious uh, where the international trend started. So you're, you're kind of starting to seeing the mirroring of your actions everywhere, right. and that's super distracting. So I kind of just shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it became too much, and and my my colleagues at work, but they were like, "Oh yeah, oh, it's, it's, uh, this is so cool! Like, or are you gonna quit your job now? No, like I'm having a good time here. I'm not going anywhere like this. Yeah. And it's but it's also good that it's it's the the text and the the video. Of course, like I wrote the text and I I took the video when I was in when I was in Rome and everything. So like it's it's my content, but it's not my face. And the the meme is the interaction between a woman. And her, oh, well, the men that were asking each other, stage, and, and women yeah. were asking each other. There's an interaction between two people, where 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 they ask about the Roman Empire, and like so, the, like I think why it went so viral is because okay, ask uh, ask your the 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 man in your life this thing, which is like a totally random question, or like, it's like no, you don't you don't realize how often this person thinks about the Roman Empire. Uh, ask them, you will be surprised. So I paint a premise that doesn't really seem plausible. So they have to, and it's a call to action, like ask them, you will be surprised. So it's like a, a, a not necessarily a very plausible premise. They ask, they get an answer that is like, yeah, I think about it pretty often. And as, uh, as was predicted, they are surprised. And it's apparently like it works and uh, it, it just it just spins. So I'm 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 not I'm no longer a part of the of the meme in that sense because it's a, the interaction between well there was an interaction but but normally the, the viral ones were the, uh, a, a, a woman asked her significant other a question and that's where the meme is. So I I I, I like people wouldn't invite me to any talk shows or anything. Which sure. is quite nice because I wouldn't have had time for that, yeah. and I don't see I don't see like my reenactment isn't necessarily like I I get um, I guess why I'm like why I am a good um, what like I I understand why it was a good place for the meme to grow from the start, but I, it's totally uninteresting to have me as a spokesperson for the meme in that sense. So it wasn't originally your question that went viral or it was someone else asked that question and it you had also asked something similar which then drove you up yeah it was a trend in sweden a year ago okay but uh, if you make content in swedish like you're never going to reach an international um so it was kind of like a waste of a good uh, of a good trend mm -hmm. so it's yeah
It's it's and I, it's a bit disappointing as well because the the Swedish media was all about yeah it was this a Swedish influencer that did it, but right, they right. never can explain how it went international, because yeah in like in a sense yeah maybe I translated, I translated the concept into English, mm-hmm. but it's, I don't know. So I was I was more quoted in in international media than I was in Swedish media on the trend. Yeah, uh, I mean, I still so completely uh, associate it with you because you're like the face of Rome right <laughs> right now. I, I didn't. So. St- I, I I wasn't the first. As I said, I, I'm not the first person to have the idea that men are obsessed with the Roman Empire. That's like an old meme, and and you can find memes about that going back a very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for this, like for this trend, it was my video that started it internationally. That's awesome. <laughs> So you just woke up so, with a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you do. No, I, I got back from, like, I, I was sitting in the, we, we were basically back, uh, going back from the event in Belgium, and I finally kind of charged my phone properly. And then it's just like, there's so many notifications and, like, people tagging me in TikTok videos. Well, like, what's going on? And then, so it was kind of, then it it uh, started to really, really go viral. Yeah. Um. Okay, so the the main thing that I saw when I first started following you is, is the femboy thing, yeah. and my understanding of that is like it's just a, a dig at like ancient Greeks and like little boys kind of thing, or like that. Yeah, it's it's it, like it, actually it's a bit problematic. I mean, <laughs> and I'm very probably. anachronistic. It, first of all, it's very anachronistic in a sense mm. uh, because of course they're like the femboys that that we that are that are usually young men that presents as. Mm. As 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 uh, or feminine traits to more more or less um, um, it's that that's not that was absolutely not what was going on uh, in ancient Greece. There is also the issue that there has been so very little research done on on this subject, so we don't really know that much. But it's more of like a meme that like Greeks, the Greeks uh, men liked young boys. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a very established meme. Which is also like when you look at the sources, depending on how you interpret it, it's not super clear what was going on, and so little because like right, right research like research about homosexuality, like when did that start properly and objectively? There is barely any research on it, like serious historical objective research on it today, even uh, which is a problem. And you don't know since homosexuality was so despised by the Abrahamitic religions, you you never know how much of it texts, art might have been destroyed um, mm-hmm. as well. Um, so so we there are a lot of puzzle pieces that we don't have, and then there is no not a lot of research uh, done on it. So we don't actually know, and it seems to differ over time and in what part in ancient Greece, what colony, what city state. So. We don't actually know that much about homosexuality in Greece, but there are a, a lot of indications that you have a lot of these relations between uh, older men and younger men, mm-hmm. whether they were uh, sexual or not. They, some of them might have been, um, some of them might not have been. Uh, we don't really, we don't really know. But it's an absolutely great meme because there is a lot of classical tropes uh, you can make uh, of between like power dynamics in couples that are just as applicable in in like heterosexual because uh, uh, during history like in a lot of history there there's not been very uncommon for older men to marry young women and this was also very uh very often done in ancient Greece um so there are a lot of these like classic heterosexual jokes you could um you could translate mm-hmm. in that sense it's 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 just a lot of and, and not not many people does it uh, does this type of content either um and especially not in like kind of now my greek impressions are not very correct necessarily uh, mm-hmm. compared to my roman ones but it's still i i do it in i i just don't put a towel over my over my shoulder um yeah. but actually put some effort into and also combining it with with like trends and also using because there are a lot of memes that are around like like me when I'm around with my homies and there's just like four guys just kissing um, right. or like when our girlfriends leave the room uh, and then the guys just start kissing. Like you could translate these things very easily into an ancient Greek context 
Right. Um, and it would be it would be fun. Um, and also that's something I also do whenever I see one of the those videos. Uh, it's like I just comment like average dinner in ancient Greece or average training session in ancient Greece or or like average uh, bathhouse visit in ancient Greece, whatever. Yeah. They seem to do really well because the comments are always like, I love reading them with people like yeah. that get the joke and all that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So there are a lot of like people, a lot of people think it's fun and I get a lot of appreciation for it. Uh, but then of course, uh, Greeks, l- l- I have a lot of Greek fans that like really enjoy the content I do, but there are some Greeks that are more on the like traditionalist, uh, orthodox, uh, identitarian side of things. Uh, also a lot of Americans that get really upset. Um, that are more on the identitarian line of of things reasoning um because like yeah you um yeah all, not all greeks were gay you're pushing an agenda mm. uh you're you're trying to bring your distorted uh, views uh, uh like distorting history with your with your views um this is nothing more than like gay propaganda right, right. like you get a lot of these uh, these comments and uh, yeah but they and it's also weird. Uh, you don't know anything about Greek history, and then there's like 18 year old boys, uh, which have no indication in their profile of being scholars. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah, you you you're a Greek guy. You here, you eat some food. Here, you stand by a car. Here, like you go for a swim. Here. Yeah. You, I don't know if you're uh, maybe you're like the best scholar in the world, but it, it doesn't seem like it. So. Um, and they also like reference some things. Oh, you should read this. Uh, you should read this text by this guy. And I'm like, yeah, I have like three times. And <laughs> it, it's it's very ambiguous because depending on how you interpret the interpret uh, it, you can land in very different conclusions. Right. So it's like I. Re- it's always like with my people might think my content is like clown content, which it is to some extent. But I do read the sources. Sometimes I even make mistakes, uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, like from the start, because if, if people correct me in the comments, that will drive interaction, <laughs> get yeah. get people to discuss. I I usually if I see I do a typo, for example. Now I'm not a I'm not a native English speaker, so I I am. Um, that drives mine up too. Yeah. I've, I I uh, I uh, like oh I did a typo here. I'll 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 let it sit. And then there's always someone commenting on the typo. It's it's never like a hundred persons, but um, yeah, or hundred people. But they're they, and that's a bit fun as well because like yeah, that means that they're reading it, reading the texts properly. Right. Um, I did uh, one of my lecture videos. I put I said conquistador in the lecture because I was just off the cuff talking, yeah. and then all the comments said like you mean Spanish colonizer and like yeah. all that stuff, which drove it up but it also was a, an opportunity for me to say like yeah you know what that's probably not the best word to use these days so let's let's go ahead and next time i'll change it and that made a whole bunch of likes and comments so i like that kind of aspect of it too yeah yeah, yeah but it's, but it's like i did the other video with the latin heritage uh month did you see that one i, don't, I probably yeah. should have i don't yeah, know yeah, it's, it's it. basically just i i and I, I made this like three weeks ago uh because i know i saw it was like the latin heritage month but I, then i forgot to post it so it sat in my drafts and then i then i found it like the other day oh no latin heritage month like ended a week ago <laughs> and so it's the premise is like i was in like basically this gear and i put like the green screen background from a mexican restaurant like uh, when I, you're invited and when you're invited to yeah invited to visit latin heritage month but they're just a bunch of mexicans and the only caesar they're talking about is someone's abuelo <laughs> uh so and you, th- then you get a lot of discussions because so this is a fun because of course this is like i have no ill intent uh with with the meme mm-hmm. um and it's 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 a play on that the latin can mean two very different things Right. Um, but you got for, for uh, some people were upset that I wasn't using like the correct term, which is uh, uh, the Hispanic uh, uh. Hispanic Heritage Month. But Hispanic and like if you want to reference the entire the entirety, Latin America is is also inclusion of the French and the Portuguese uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Portuguese speakers who is not necessarily identify themselves with the Hispanic with the Hispanic labor. They also a lot of people from south and central america like yeah don't listen to the americans 
<laughs> <laughs> so so it's it's the 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 and then there were some people. Oh yeah. Uh, like uh, some white guy from Europe comes and tell us what is Latin, not I'm like no, that's not what what's happening. Yeah. So it's it's people are angry for very very different reasons, and then mm. fighting each other in the comments, uh, uh, and defending me for very different reasons, and defending the meme. So it's like people are like fighting, <laughs> and I'm I'm sitting there and like oh yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm made a meme. <laughs> It's hard sometimes when people come to your defense because then it might not be your exact thing you would like to say, and then it, then they assume it like represents you. And sometimes I'll step in, but yeah, yeah it, it is interesting when you get a community. The 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 what is it? The enemy of my enemy is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, never heard that. <laughs> yeah, it's Her uh, but it's yeah it's it's all because uh, some content I make that is more on the controversial side. It can be also interpreted in many different ways. Like what? It, like is this video? So there was there was some. I don't. But it was like a couple months back. I made a video about like gays in ancient Greece, mm -hmm. uh, like one of those classic ones. And I got like a super angry comment that like, oh, that you're um, you're a Marxist Jew. Uh, you're spreading gay propaganda. You are this. You're a pedophile. This. You're pedophilic views you're trying to bring that into the minds of yeah blah blah, blah. so something like that all the classics then, like, yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> and then 10 minutes later i get like a comment god i'm so tired of this fascist homophobia in the and it was directed at the video because yeah it's making fun of gay people it's like well no that's not really what's going on so on the other on one side i'm a fascist and on the other side i'm a marxist like you never really know what um yeah what to it's um yeah i'm a, i don't know <laughs> I, that's the hard thing too and like i i piss off both sides all the time yeah. and it's hard to figure out like appease them both and especially right now it's like can't we just look down yeah. the, the middle but that's, um, a, that's such a problem with the polarized society and that it doesn't like it's more important uh what you like what you believe in or like your politics are more uh important than your actions so you get judged for you get judged for things that might be as and especially like when you have when when people are in, think that they're entitled to to speak for you in what you mean and what you say mm -hmm. um so they basically oh yeah you said this this thing and that's insensitive because this reason and then i'm like well it's no it's not about that i'm saying this thing it has nothing to do with this Oh yeah, yeah. but uh, that's this is, and then you have the other side. So the so the some sometimes people on like the the more progressive side gets mad, and some the more conservative or identitarian side gets mad. So and you try to stay in, you just want to stay in the middle and have fun. Yeah, um, no, exactly. And not and not everything is. Uh, I mean, people t tend to. It's like I get a lot of criticize criticism for glorifying the Roman Empire, hmm. um, which I absolutely don't think I am doing. Yeah, but, you just like, um, poking fun at it. Yeah, yeah. So and and there, but the thing is that there, the a lot of things that the Romans did was absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. um, it was a slave society. It was very corrupt. Uh, a lot of wars, uh, conquest that wasn't necessarily like the way they put down rebellions. Sometimes were just absolutely brutal. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you had a lot of like economic development. Um, uh, sanitation, uh, the roads, the trade networks, uh, the general internal peace. That, so there, so there is so many an art. So there are so many things to admire about the Roman Empire, but that doesn't mean that we should forget that it also was a pretty shitty place as well. Right. Especially if you were not a Roman citizen. Yeah, and a third of the empire was enslaved. So it's yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, and we're back. Um, last we were talking about, I think we ended on fanboys, but now I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions, but they don't have to be rapid fire. Okay. So, do you have a Byzantine? license for that? <laughs> do what? <laughs> do you have a license for the rapid fire? No, uh, no, you need a concealed carry, I think, which is okay, yeah, the whole thing here. Um, I can carry a Gladius, though, and a Pillum. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, have you ever performed Testudo? Yes. What does that feel like? Um, it's um, the the biggest one I've done was with like sixty or seventy uh, legionaries. 
okay. which was uh, uh, in in Belgium. Now. Wait, like sixty to seventy people in the same formation? Yes, yes. So before yeah. that, I've, I've we have mostly been like sixteen or something. I think was the biggest one before that we did in Denmark, uh, which is still pretty nice. But the it's it's also we were in the field. It's like uh, thirty degrees Celsius. Uh, what is that in Fahrenheit? Like uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> seventy Fahrenheit. I don't know, thirty. Yeah. Are you saying it's hot it's, or cold? Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty hot. Okay. So it basically, we were like we were standing out. We have been marching in the day. We had been doing all these formations, and then very and then in Belgium was is, was an event with the, some of the best groups or considered best groups in Europe. So it was kind of synced, and we have practiced before. So it was a very fast movement into this testudo, and you're very cramped. You don't see anything. You don't hear anything because uh, when you're in the middle, everything just echoes in between the shields, and you hear you hear the orders and people like pushing. But the good thing is you're in shade, <laughs> so <laughs> so then you That's can scary. fight uh, fight at the, in the middle of the day. But it's very it's it's an experience. In a sense, I can kind of detach from it because I know it's not real. Right. But in a sense, it is real because we're actually doing that same type of, of formation. So it's an experience. Yeah. Um, it's and it's uh, and it looks extremely good. Yeah. As well, when you do it, because like you can you can explain the basics of a testudo with just like twelve people, but to really see it at almost a full century, that's um, that's something else. Yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, is your testosterone like pumping and you like feel like you're growing a beard when you're doing it or is it just kind of hectic? It's, yeah, it's like sometimes you kind of get immersed to it, but it's more like the, then you're more focused on like, we're going to do a good show. But some, t- like when you're, when you're running against, like when you're running against the, um, the audience and like screaming, like in a charge, there you actually yeah. feel that there is, that's very powerful. Yeah. Uh, I, as, as I try to stay detached from these things. And not invest too much emotionally in like a, a show in that sense, but uh, mm. but it's um, you, you're up there and and feeling a, a portion of it at least, which is um, which is fascinating. That's got to be fun. I've seen it in many like movies and reenactments, but I saw the the eagle with Channing Tatum. I forget yeah. Jamie Bell, I think is the kid's name. Uh, and in the very beginning, of the, have you seen that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask your favorite Roman movie after this, but just that beginning scene where they go out to rescue the captives and they just, he's like, perform to do and like just how quick they do it. It's like. Every time I see that, like, man, they had their shit together. It's so cool. Uh, the thing is when you practice so the romans I, I don't know there's this saying i don't know who who wrote it but uh that the roman practice is like a a bloodless battle and uh, the roman battles are are like bloody bloody exercises or something uh, so bloodless on their end their their exercises are a bloodless bloodless war mm. so they're basically doing the same thing and then the the their battles is a, is a bloody exercise gotcha. because it's 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 for real. Um, but they apparently drilled a lot, and they 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 were. And if you practice with the same people, the same movements, over time, like things are gonna work, and things are gonna work fast. And it's the same thing. Well, when, when I played a lot of sports when I was a kid, if I know that like Magnus will always sprint. Um, on the left side, uh, on the left side after a corner in soccer, I know that. Oh, if I get the ball, I know Magnus is going to go there, and then Carl is coming in from the other side. So you always kind of know where people are, um, rather than you would play with random people. You have no idea how they work. So it's uh, you learn to work with people, and especially if you if you practice these exact movements and everyone do it together, things are going to go fast. In, uh, after a while yeah no that's gotta it would have been so cool to see that i mean not if it's coming at you but <laughs> uh yeah to you know on the battlements but uh favorite roman movie or show so i i i love life of brian 
uh, which is uh, the Monty oh, they, Python yeah. the Monty right. Python movie because it's brilliant in so many ways. But in terms of like an actual serious, uh, serious movie, I would say uh, Ben Hur. Okay, like the old one, not the new one, because that was bad. Uh, because it has so. Um, I didn't know there was a new one. Yeah, it's it's. Don't watch it. It's. Uh, <laughs> or, well, you can watch it because like it's. There are some scenes that are pretty powerful, but uh, but it's just it's a very long movie, and it's the same time with like the old Spartacus movie, the the Cleopatra movie from like the late fifties. Uh, six, early 60s um, where you have a lot of these very long movies with with a lot of budget and some decent scripts um, so but Ben Hur is basically about this um, have, have you seen it the old one yeah yeah Charlton yeah. Heston okay, yeah. then I don't yeah I don't have to uh, ex- explain it <laughs> I'm gonna mansplay Ben Hur to you <laughs> You're fine, <laughs> but yeah. So and there's and also that you get all these like uh, uh, Bible or, or the new the, the Jesus shows up uh, all the time doing fun things. Um, mm-hmm. So you have this is a story about um, about the Jews and the Romans, mm-hmm. but there are also these Christian elements coming in. So it's uh, and it it discovers like the war. There is a slavery. There is a sickness and suffering. Uh, there is a triumphant hero. Right. It's there are so many interesting elements in this uh, in this movie. It kind of so, harkens back to like when I was saying if I could time travel to one spot, it'd be like Jerusalem at the height of that because yeah. you just see so much cool stuff. Yeah. Um, not a guy getting nailed. Well, you'd see guys getting nailed to the cross all over the empire at all times. But, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. And kids. Uh, okay, if you were enslaved and put in a gladiator ring. Oh dear. What's your weapon? Well, that's not really up to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I would go with a very, very standard um, sword and shield mm. uh, combo. Same. Uh, I, I could do um, the net. I think I, I actually have a net. It's hanging right uh, here. Um, Does it have a, a Latin name? I forget. Uh, I crash everything. <laughs> I have, have uh, a net. <laughs> I have my net here. Um, <laughs> it's not usually it's not usually hanging here. It's just I was uh, I'm picking going through some of my uh, uh, my reenactment stuff to put put into the uh, basement. No, it's not the basement. The Actually. storage uh, for for the winter season when I'm not using it. Um, so it's uh, by, by by accident. It was very close by. Um, but uh, I would probably go with this, with this, with the Murmillo style, which is the big, big shield and 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 the sword. Or I would do the Hoplomachus with the with the spear, because spear is a very it's an under underrated uh, weapon, like a long bow staff kind of one you fight with or when you throw. Yeah, yeah, you can go do both, of course. Yeah, but it's it's um, it's more of a fighting spear than a throwing spear. Okay. And the scutum is the big kind of cylindrical looking one. Exactly. Okay. Or a shield, I should say. And then a pillum is the the dart you throw kind of. Yeah. Thing. It's the big, the big throwing spear. So. Okay. And that's more of a legionary thing. Or a yeah. Soldier. Um, they might have been used in arenas as well because like there were a lot of gladiator fights going on. Yeah. But you, so you never know. But uh, they had the special classes that were kind of standardized. Yeah. Okay. Gladiator Prin, do you know what happened to the Legion of the Ninth? They kind of disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really know. It's there are a lot of theories, but I it's um, I, like shit happens. Like get over it, <laughs> especially <laughs> north of the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exa- no, but they like Roman armies have been massacred hmm. from time to time. Um, you see it during the Cimbrian War, uh, during the, uh, the wars with Hannibal. It ha- like it in the Teutoburg Forest. Like it happens that the Romans get their ass kicked hard, sure. um, so that's might what have happened here as well. But we don't really know. You hear an elephant coming across the Alps. What's your first choice? Run, fight. That well, the thing is, fun. like, yeah. But <laughs> the thing is with the um, with the elephants is that during the time of of um, of the wars with the Carthaginians, the Romans have already learned how to fight the Punic elephants. Wars, right? Yeah, uh, exactly the Punic Wars. Yeah. Um, uh, they have fought them with Epirus or Pyrus. Uh, Pyrus of Epirus uh, brought elephants, so the Roman kind of learned. How, there's still like an 
uh, an intimidating sight, but there was also not a lot of the elephants who um, who survived uh, the trip over the Alps. So the importance of Carthaginian elephants is a bit exaggerated, uh. and um, it's um, yeah. When the Romans then used war elephants themselves, but more to intimidate. So they brought them to England, for example. Yeah, but, I um, about that. And they they have never fought elephants or seen them, so that must be would have been scary. So I would just have fought them with javelins or the the they put the pigs on fire, <laughs> which is a, they, wow. they, they had like a, a had a where you a, an ancient anti elephant tactic where they had pigs and they put the pigs on fire, so they were just running because like yeah pigs have a lot of fat that burns very very well, so oh they're basically God. something coming at you screaming on fire like what well, what would you of course you i was I, I would be scared if a big burning pig came running at me i would be scared so there was one tactic and like they kind of understood how to how to like mow them down from a distance as well and I once the, the elephants panic like they are also a danger to to the own troops right. uh, so to speak that's crazy my uh, my great uncle was an anti aircraft gunner on Iwo Jima, but somebody was an anti elephant in that was I shouldn't say that cut that out <laughs> an anti elephant <laughs> anti elephant pig master yeah. fighting elephants in London. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Probably, you never know. Yeah, yeah. So so they they always. I mean, this this is the the thing with antiquity that. You, you kind of understand how to conquer some of these more exotic elements. So, yeah. for example, war chariots became obsolete because everyone knew how to fight them. Elephants become absolute because people learned how to how to defeat them. Yeah. So mm. things work for a things work for a while until people understand how to um, to take them out, and then they become obsolete. Yeah, I had taken a Hellenistic Greece class, which was the most entertaining and rewarding and educational class I ever had in college. Um, just so in depth on everything, but he was saying that like in the movie, Alexander, they, and I know this is Macedonian, not Greek, but they make it seem like the Greeks had never seen elephants before. I mean, likely not in battle, but they went to Babylon. They went to the Indus Valley. Like they had seen some, so they, they yeah. went there. Yeah. But I forget about that too. There were probably elephants. I mean, they had circuses, I think, in Rome, right? Yes, yeah, but the, the thing is that elephants wasn't necessarily so during the time of like it was basically when the when the Romans had defeated uh, the the Carthaginians that they could really start to expand. So they took North Africa, and when they had North Africa, they got easier access to a lot of exotic animals. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of during the late Republic and the early Empire where all the luxury comes in and all these uh, big amounts of, of animals. And for example, the Colosseum wasn't constructed until after the, the first Jewish war, for example. Um, hmm. So it's uh, a lot of, a lot of things that we like Rome at its peak is very different from Rome during the Punic Wars in terms of, of the of the society and how much resources they had and how much control they had over the Mediterranean. You said they built the um, column after the first Jewish revolt, or did I hear you wrong? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's um, um, they sacked the temple and everything. Um, yeah, with, uh, which is uh, an important, uh, also an important uh, date in the in Jewish history. Right. Um, and they, yeah, they took a lot of war war bounty, and part of that war bounty was used uh, to build uh, the Colosseum. Um, and then did you don't know, know that. uh, that's and that's also theories that did they take a lot of, of of slaves from Judea to build it? Yes or no? There are different theories about that as well. Yeah. Um, but um, it's uh, it's uh, sponsored <laughs> by the yeah. by the temple. <laughs> To some extent, at least, which that's is uh, which is very tragic in many ways. But like that's um, that's how things were two thousand years ago. Though there yeah. were no there were no rules of conduct uh, in that sense. I always had an idea for a story where it's like a Jewish. I mean, I say this as a Jewish person, but a Jewish, you know, captive got taken, but the 
the owner knew he was like funny and he goes around the Roman empire doing stand up shows. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if he gets his freedom or not at the end. I gotta, I gotta sort that out. I never really spent too much time on it, but anyway, I think that might be a movie. It's kind of sort of like, it's Life a good, it's a, it's yeah. um, it's a Netflix, uh, it's a Netflix series where every episode is a new part of the empire <laughs> and some, some jokes that are super, so I can see, I can really see this. That you have like a joke that would work super well in like northern Italy and then, is absolutely oh. despised and booed in Greece. That is, and so then funny. like so you yeah, because you have the cultural differences, and then there happens things along the way. I think you could really build on this uh, on this story, and also take a lot of anachronistic experience from like yeah. stand up today. Like he's like it's live in Tunis or live yeah. in Barcelona or something. Londonium uh, different, <laughs> and you also have you have a very specific heckler uh, <laughs> every time that is like the uh, uh, from the from the local culture, of course. That would be really funny. So can, it's a good point. What's the what's the difference between like a, Go- a Gallic heckler and a Greek heckler in the terms of? I think there's a lot of content there actually. Yeah, no, like it's not a bad. Head. It's a good idea actually. I uh I thought about it a lot when I was younger when I was in that class. I, I'll, I'll write that down. I have another one about dogs that I've been working on too. But uh, the other question I had was uh, favorite Roman emperor. I know you said something before, but uh, it's usually between like you say depending on what yeah depending on what mood I'm in, it's either Trajan or uh, Vespasian. Okay. But both of them have their faults as well, because the problem is also with um, having a favorite emperor. Like you can appreciate emperors for all the good things they did, but all of these were also like, yeah, <laughs> warring, warring dictators that executed people for basically no reason with and slaves just, and vomitoriums. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I can I can appreciate Augustus for everything he did. But yeah, that was. I wouldn't want him as my prime minister in Sweden. That's for sure. <laughs> um, it's. Uh, but yeah, I usually go with Trajan or, or Vespasian because they're kind of very formative for Rome on its peak. And uh, despite all the dumb things they did, they did a lot of good things as well. And really, I, I don't know. It's hard to get into detail without having to list all the dumb things they did as well. Right. So it's uh, yeah. But it's, those are usually safe bets. Okay, and what specifically about Trajan? I think the way that he, like, first he was a military man. He was able to really uh, finish finishing off a lot of conquering and therefore, like, continuing the Pax Augusta, uh, in a sense, uh, where he he removed uh, some very dangerous enemies uh, for Rome, um, and also a lot of interesting building projects. He was a decent administrator. Then he had a lot of issues as well. Yeah. Um, and and with Vespasian, it's basically that he managed to come out on top of the after after Nero and then the the year of the four emperors. I totally uh, forgot Vespasian exists. Yeah, yeah. So he's and founding the Flavian dynasty, which was was also very instrumental in uh, in in getting Rome rolling up to its peak years. That leads to my next question. Um... What do you believe was the main downfall of the Roman Empire? It's well, probably were, a loaded question, but yeah, there is no one main thing. Like when societies crumble, there are a multitude of inside and outside factors, mm-hmm. um, and there are like specific, like there are specific happenings during the during the time that okay, yeah, here first of all, it's of course the that they, the fact that they removed the Republic, putting a lot of power into the hands of one person, mm-hmm. which is not necessarily a very good thing. Never works uh, out. Yeah, and you you lose you lose a sense of unity in many ways. And then you also have like that Romans didn't understand economy mm. um, in the way that we do. Like <laughs> a lot of people don't understand economy today either. <laughs> but <Fair. laughs> but we have we ha- like. Uh, we know what happens when you when you debase the currency and and, and everything, um, and when you when you put uh, the trading embargoes on things and you, yeah, you kind of you kind of know what happens. Um, so you have a lot of 
issues with inflation. You have uh, the general like displaced tribes uh, that Rome sometimes were very good ally- allying with and then kind mm-hmm. of sometimes not al- allying with them. So they have to fight them instead. Um, you had the crum- crumbling infrastructure because during the height of Rome, you, uh, you, you conquered a lot and you got a lot of resources from you know, basically from stealing it from other like they had, they produced a lot of things uh, in Rome as well, but a lot yeah. of money for these big building building projects sometimes came from, because you bu- basically took them from tribes you defeated. Um, and the problem is like when you don't get a lot of extra money, you can't really educate people to take care of it either. So even though, yeah, in us, in this city, we built this big thing, but we haven't got anyone from Rome to come and take care of it for for 70 years now and it's starting to crumbling and we don't really know we don't know how an aqueduct works yeah we don't know how a bathhouse really works and so society like starts to crumble yeah uh, there are a lot of of uh, internal struggles and internal struggles always of course weakens a society uh, towards uh, external enemies um, so it's 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 increased like uh, decreased uh, coherency in the empire, uh, mm-hmm. external threats, uh, bad uh, bad managing of, of 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 economy and 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 everything. so it's like it's just and when like it's not just one thing but a lot of things that makes things like crumble mess, over time. Yeah. And it was a, the the fall and decline of the Roman Empire was going on for a, it was not like. Oh yeah, we're here is Rome. We are having a good time. Oh, there are some Goths, and now everything is destroyed. Right. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was a l- couple of hundred years, a process, where it kind of slowly declined. But then you still had the Byzantine Empire, uh, that prospered very well for a long time. Right. So it's kind of the west, the western parts of the empire that fell. Two things to um, that. One, are you aware of like the, the Goth girlfriend memes? Yeah, of course. You should make one about the goths. Maybe you have. I haven't seen it yet. There's something there, probably. Yeah, I think it's it's um, I, I've I've it's been on my mind a couple times, mm. but it's it's not as effective. So, like, thing when I make the fanboy memes, I can kind of have them off screen because. But I think the goth girlfriends for for it to be interesting, they kind of have to be on screen, in a sense. I think so. I have uh. to find a goth girl. I just put like a hot I, topic in the background of your yeah yeah maybe yeah. yes yeah but I'll 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 think a bit of because I mean I've I've had the thought I just never yeah. executed the thought uh, in any meaningful way but I've seen a lot of the memes yeah uh, and I follow some like Twitter artists that do those uh, <laughs> do those memes quite often as well that one caught me off guard I didn't understand it at first but now I just laugh at them but yeah. uh, I kind of always saw it as. Not that Christianity was the downfall, but once that started spreading throughout the empire, which I thought was interesting because of all the roads and how easy it was to spread things, like yep. that's when you start finding like the Byzantine Eastern or Western split, and then Constantine baptizing himself. Like, if not the downfall, it definitely was a change to like people's ontology. I think, and yep. I always found that neat. But it's also also depend like you've also had a a lot of coherency thanks to Christianity as well. So it's, um, yeah, but there, the, there has been like just when there are struggles in a society, regardless of, of the source and, and reli- religious struggle, of course, also weakens the coherency in a society. Right. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, it might very well be one of, 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 uh, one of the factors for the follow room. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Um, so with Hadrian's Wall and Germanic peoples, which you should be familiar with, what do you think is the main reason that they weren't able to conquer them? I'm assuming it's just getting resources out there to the frontier. But yeah, it's not like it's also it's like everything has an alternative cost. Hmm. Like if we conquer Germany, we can't have those three three legions conquer this place instead. And so it was. It was always more rational, I think, for the Romans because they conquered parts of Germany and they had some successful campaigns. But there wasn't necessarily anything there to gain because it was more. I think it was more trouble than it was worth. Mm-hmm. 
Because, yeah, there's just a lot of forests and mountains and fields and angry people. And it's the same, like, why why didn't they go north of the Hadrian Wall? Yeah, because it's cold <laughs> and there are angry angry Picts there. And it's like, there's wet, nothing. Like, no. Yeah. But if you, yeah, if you go to the east, oh, you have, uh, because of the conquests of Alexander the Great, you have big parts of, um, of the east being Hellenized, which mm-hmm. means that they're, like they have nice buildings, they have administration, they have infrastructure, they have learned men, they have medicine. Everyone is having a good time. So that's, for example, one uh, during during the times of Caesar. Caesar get a get a lot of rep, of course, for conquering Gaul. But but for Rome, uh, the conquests of Pompey, Pompey the Great, was a lot more important mm-hmm. because you get access to a lot more resources. Uh, a lot more people who are like who knows medicine, who knows engineering, uh, who knows all the the the, the, the intelligentsia of of that was very prevalent in the East uh, became very accessible to Rome. In Gaul, yeah. yeah, I mean the the Gauls weren't like we we like to call them barbarians, but they were not. Uh, they had working societies. Huh. Um, and actually, a lot of very good craftsmen and and stuff. But in France, really? Or, yeah, you or would like be surprised. Even... But that's uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the, yeah. No, but they, they, there was an abs- like there was absolutely a, a functioning society in many ways. Then they have a lot of issues, of course, and sure. they were not on par with 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 Rome in any way. But um, they were in no way savages. Sure. But in the East, they were actually in, uh, like, in some regards, more advanced than the Romans. So the conquest of of the Eastern provinces was more important to the development and growth of Rome uh, than Caesar's conquest in Gauls were. But then Caesar won the, of course, he won the civil war, and the winner writes the history, and of course, Augustus has uh, has an interest in in painting Caesar as a as the as the good guy because he was the, became the adoptive adoptive yeah. son of Caesar so it's um Pompey doesn't get enough enough credit in yeah. that regard I think I totally forgot about all that history that's yeah it's so interesting so three more favorite battle if you have one I don't I don't like battle I like when people are, <laughs> are friends <laughs> no but there are so many I think uh, a lot of the more interesting battles are the are the Roman defeats okay why is that? Because it shows that that Rome is not like the, the, it shows one of the strengths of Rome that they're not invincible, but they always get back up on their feet. Yeah. Um, so the That's defeats true. they suffered during the Cimbrian Wars, um, the defeats uh, against uh, Hannibal, for example, and even the struggles, like the early struggles against like Spartacus uh, and the slave revolts, are super fascinating. Because uh, they show that if if the Romans overextend or they're not prepared, like they are, doesn't matter if they're trained and well equipped, like they will lose. Because mm-hmm. the battles where the Romans are like, yeah, we're we're like the most disciplined and best equipped army the world has ever seen up until this point, and like we're fighting people that are naked, like <laughs> who cares? Yeah, that's not that's not fun. <laughs> It's it's more fun when you have like these very desperate battles uh-huh. uh, where the Romans like manage to win, or when they just get crushed because they're dumb, or yeah. their commander is dumb. So um, I really like that answer because like even with Alexander, which I'm way more familiar with than yeah. Rome, like Wagamela and the Hydaspes River or the Battle of Hydaspes, yeah. I think they. It was brutal. Like they almost Absolutely. lost, and yeah. Like, yeah, just shows the strength of the empire, just like pushing through. But yeah. Battle of High Despies, I think it was called. Anyway, no, I really, I really like that answer. Uh, and then to move on to the to end, as a reenactor and someone who's been doing this, like I'm someone who works with the public. I, I teach the public. I've had some experiences like this. But what is your most rewarding experience doing this like a kid learning something or someone sending you something or just an experience you had yeah the re- though that's that's when we managed to perform an event where it's obvious that the that the visitors and the audience is having a good time mm-hmm. and the members of my group uh is having a good time 
that we manage to to keep our shows are are on point. Everyone eats the food we make. Yeah, uh, we learn new stuff. We're having a good time together, and like the visitors are get to see the different aspects of the Roman army and the Roman society and really appreciate it. Yeah. And because uh, some events are better than others, but when like everything is. Because that, that's also that then we manage to, we have a good time. Uh, we manage to teach people a lot and they're having fun at the same time. And also like it shows that we are able to, to fix the logistics around everything, like that we work as a group. There are many different uh, parts that feels rewarding. Like working together like a Roman, you know, legion. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great, it's a great outlook on it. And, I imagine it's because you get full on immersed, like you're wearing a costume now, like you said, you're cooking and there's all the event planning and all that. And then, yeah, yeah, it's, it's gotta be rewarding. Sure. Yeah. When things like there is a lot of, when you're having these, like there are always issues and, um, sure. but, uh, as long as, as long as I'm having more fun that I'm having demanding work, like it's going to be a net positive for me and I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. But, uh, if the struggles are worse than the the fun fun stuff, then it's it's just draining. But yeah. it's it has been a net a, a strong net positive for me in my in my current group here. Great, oh, oh that's good for you, man. That's got to be, yeah, yeah, rewarding. Um, where can people find you? So I'm uh, I'm on uh, TikTok and Instagram and Twitter as guys Flavius. Well, Twitter, I'm actually guys Flavius G, uh, because there was there, there was some guy who hasn't it. posted for like twelve years who has the handle guys Flavius, some American <laughs> guy I've never never heard of. There was like this 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 idea. Uh, someone talked about yeah that uh, Elon Musk is going to remove all the inactive accounts, and I'm like yeah let's go let's go let's go, <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't happened, so he's still there. And I'm also on YouTube. Um, I didn't um, know that. Okay. No, it, I have like I posted. I I kind of forgot to upload everything to YouTube, so it's not really inactive. But I'm gonna start doing that uh, now. Okay. Uh, just upload all the reels, so they are there. I I might do some longer longer content on there in the future, but for now, it's just uh, YouTube Shorts. You could kill it with that, dude. Like just going around showing people your camp, like in a vlog style, yeah. or someone just follows you. Yeah. And yeah. that that was a plan we had for this year. But uh, we kind of, we were a bit few people on the events and the external events were a bit more, not all groups think content all the time. So it's hard to get the, the space for it. So yeah, we kind of need, we need to plan better to make this, uh, make this really work. But hopefully next year we can do, uh, we can do things like that. I'd love to see it. And then, yeah, dude, I, my Instagram's not huge, but like I've definitely loved instagram for the the networks i can make and just reaching out to comedians that i like that will respond and stuff and i saw your stuff and i just i don't remember i think i replied to a story or something i can't remember but you just chat at least once a week since then and i appreciate you it's been yeah i appreciate it's the same it's uh but it's also one thing i let you get to because i you you have a large following uh compared Mm -hmm. to to most of the people, even on even on YouTube, like and 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 TikTok especially, so but it's it's to to get to get big on different uh, platforms, you kind of have to know what what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's it's a proof that you that you know what you're doing, and it's also nice having these discussions with with people and uh, like get their angles on things. So I I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate I, I really appreciate you and uh, many other people like you that I get to interact with through through yeah. Instagram mainly. I appreciate that, dude. The creator community, I guess, is what it's yeah, called. Right. Yeah. I don't know what to call myself, but um, anthropologist <laughs> is what I go with. But <laughs> I'm just a regular guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I post on Instagram. Yeah, um, exactly. And you said you had a Discord too, right? I have a Discord server, um, but it's like. It's most for the, we have like this, uh, crafting hangouts every Wednesday. Okay. We just sit and craft together, uh, is which is, uh, guys, Flavius too. Or I have, to advertise yeah, that. it's, it's, yeah, there is a link in my Instagram bio. Okay. I don't know the, I don't even remember what it's called. It's called like guys and friends or something. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, well, I don't know how to say bye in Latin. I probably should, but you speak Spanish, so pues yeah. gracias. Y adiós. Gracias. Sí, sí, sí. Muy bien. <laughs> muy, muy bien. Me, me gusta Roma. <laughs> yeah, me, sí. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah, take it easy. See you guys next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.